Hello, everybody. Um, welcome back. Um, before we start with this um, session, there's some information that some of you might find interesting. Um, some of you need certificates of attendance for claiming expenses back or for your internal audit processes. As a new feature, if you go to your IECR membership page um, and you click on some stuff, there is the uh, certificate of attendance already produced for you. So you don't have to ask anybody for it. You've already got it in your IECR thingy. So um, thank you for that. So, um, and over to the session chair. Kasu. Okay, so welcome back to the afternoon session. Um, hope you, everybody had uh, enjoyed your lunch. So uh, in the afternoon, we, we will have two consecutive sessions. The first session is going to be about policy. And I'm very happy to have Jennifer talking about crypto wars. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everybody, and um, thank you for having me here. It is an honor to be in this illustrious community, and I appreciate so much the work that all of you are doing to keep us safe and secure. Um, so thank you for having me. Uh, I am uh, the ACLU's Surveillance and Cybersecurity Council, um, and I used to run the Stanford Center for Internet and Society, and I am a board member for Let's Encrypt, which is, as you know, a nonprofit now, uh, the largest certificate authority. Um, and I see a number of my Let's Encrypt friends out there, so hello and <laughs> thank you. Um, so this area is very important to me as a policy matter, and that is you know, basically what my work at the ACLU entails. Um, and I want to just sort of come out um, in the front and sort of state what my, um, what my prejudices are. And even though I'm a lawyer, my prejudice is that I don't believe that the law alone can provide enough protection to ensure civil liberties, privacy, security, and human rights. I think that a technology is required in order to achieve that goal, and that is, for me, the political or policy reason why I care so much about the, the crypto wars. So, this is a pretty sophisticated audience, um, and I don't have that much time, and so I don't want to take too much time going over things that people already know. So I'm going to assume um, some knowledge on the part of this audience of the history of the crypto wars through the 90s, of the Apple versus FBI litigation, and I'm going to um, sort of focus specifically on um, today, and I'm going to focus specifically on the US policy debate. Um, as a US lawyer, this is what I'm most familiar with, although if people are interested, um, I'm aiming to be able to take some questions towards the end. If people are interested, I can talk a little bit more about what's going on in some other countries other than the United States. So um, the cryptography policy debate in the United States today is uh, quite different than it was two years ago. And I think two years ago, I felt pretty optimistic. Um, after the Snowden revelations, we were seeing this very successful push on the part of companies providing communication services um, to individuals to encrypt their um, products, encrypt their networks. Um, we saw Apple's victory in 2016 over the FBI's effort to force the company to create new software in order to be able to defeat iPhone security. Um, Facebook turned on end-to-end -end on WhatsApp by default in 2016. Um, and, you know, we're still seeing these progr this progress in encryption. Facebook just announced that it's going to um, provide end-to-end -end encryption on its other uh, messaging products, in Instagram and Messenger. Um, and Apple is still continuing to innovate with the iPhone, making it harder and harder to break in, even as forensic companies like Celebrate, you know, are basically engaged in that kind of uh, war, making it, you know, to, to crack in. Um, but despite these optimistic signs, I think today um, the conversation looks a lot different. We are a long way from the time in 2017 when the Australian Prime Minister declared to general ridicule that the laws of mathematics are very commendable, but the only law that applies in Australia is the law of Australia. And, you know, people laughed, rightly so, but today Australia has a law that gives its intelligence and law enforcement agencies the ability to present a um, technical capability notice 
which would require providers subject to that law to create a new interception capability um, if it's needed in order to conduct wiretapping. Um, and we don't know exactly right now what this law really means. The regulations are still being negotiated and battled over and haven't really gone into effect yet. We don't know how um, the provision is going to be incorporated. But, you know, this is, Australia has this law, the UK has a law that has some similar um, properties. And the, these countries, particularly the Five Eyes countries, UK, US, Australia, um, New Zealand, and Canada, have gotten together and presented this kind of concerted, uh, uniform effort to raise the law enforcement and intelligence problems with uh, secure, strong encryption. Basically pointing out that, you know, these obstacles to law enforcement and counterterrorism that strong encryption, um, that strong encryption brings are a real danger to the sovereignties of this state, um, to the state executing its public safety mission. And um, while these, the Five Eyes countries um, haven't, you know, done anything, their statement does contain a veiled threat. Um, if you, the companies, um, aren't going to do anything, should governments continue to encounter impediments to lawful access to information, it may be necessary that we pursue technological, enforcement, legislative, or other measures to achieve lawful access solutions. Um, and so this is, you know, basically a shot across the bow or a warning message to tech companies that provide secure encryption to individuals. And it comes at a time where um, these companies have never been under as much public scrutiny as they are now and have never really um, suffered the kind of public relations, negative public relations that they are suffering now. So it comes at a time of particular policy weakness, I think, for uh, the um, communications medium that so many of us use. Um, maybe not so many of us necessarily in this audience, but so many people around the world use. Um, you know, we may all be, uh, signal or wire users, but, <laughs> you know, WhatsApp has a billion, has a billion users. It's very impactful what ends up happening there. Um, so I think you can see in the um, Five Eyes statement that there are a couple of unspoken assumptions in the statement that I want to just kind of pull out. And the main assumption um, in the statement is an assertion of the um, propriety of trust. Um, the assumption is that these Western English-speaking common law countries have governments that can be trusted that their access will be lawful um, and that it will be proportionate and that is for a um, public safety purpose. Um, these are human rights respecting countries. They have like actual surveillance laws that are meant to constrain the power of government. Um, and so, you know, when an agent of this, one of these governments comes forward with legal process, the um, unspoken assumption is that it's going to be um, that it's going to be for a legitimate reason. So I don't think that that I don't think that that um, unspoken assumption should be assumed. We have seen um, from the Snowden revelations, and you know, as an ACLU lawyer, I can tell you many, many more that um, even the best of these governments, and I personally do believe that the United States has, you know, the strongest or among the strongest um, surveillance privacy laws of, you know countries around the world, but our laws are not enough. Our um, government disregards them, the laws are too weak, there's all these workarounds, nobody knows what the laws are. I mean, just one small example, when um, law enforcement comes forward and says, you know, we want lawful access pursuant to court order, the thing I hear as an American and as a lawyer is, not pursuant to a warrant, which is our basically our highest form of legal process protection for private information. And I think they say that because we are in litigation in a number of cases, we've appeared as friend of the court, in cases where the Department of Justice is arguing that email is not protected by a warrant requirement, that they're able to get email without getting a warrant first. Um, so when you have this kind of disingenuous, you know, warrant-proof area, which is one of the, you know, kind of law enforcement tar talking points, and yet on the other hand, you have law enforcement saying we don't even need a warrant, it really doesn't give you a lot of faith that, um, you know, we can have trust in the assumption that this is going to be a power that's going to be exercised, um, that's going to be exercised with restraint and only with the strongest of, um, either with the strongest of protections to ensure that it's not abused or is um, unnecessary. 
Um, nevertheless, uh, domestically here, um, Attorney General Robert Barr has made this fight, the crypto fight, one of his signature issues for his um, tenure in uh, the Department of Justice. Um, and so he's really pushed it forward. But I just want to you know, point out and make clear that uh, Attorney General Barr does not represent or the views of the United States government more generally. And I think this is pretty obvious when you think about it, but worth saying as part of the policy debate, different agencies inside the United States government feel very differently about the value of strong encryption depending upon where you work. So you can imagine the State Department is interested in human rights, the Commerce Department is interested in innovation and economic competition. Um, you have agencies like the Federal Trade Commission, which are concerned about consumer privacy. Um, and you know, even within the Department of Homeland Security, you have an a agency like the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which you know, has expressed the importance of encrypting sensitive data. But you have immigration um, and customs and the Secret Service that feels the need to um, you know, have this information. The NSA itself has different equities than law enforcement agencies do, um, because the NSA has different constraints than law enforcement does. And so these government agencies are not in lockstep. Um, and I think it's important to be very aware of that. But from a public presentation, it certainly seems very much because Barr has taken this front and center point that this is a real push by this administration. That's something that um, he's putting a lot of time and his personal, personal credibility um, on the line for. Now, the United States Senate seems even more strident and more bipartisanly united against strong end-to-end -end encryption um, than, you know, the, than the, the executive branch. So just last month, there was a hearing about encryption before the Senate Intelligence Committee. And at the hearing, there were, um, there were witnesses from Apple and from Facebook. Um, they testified. And you, you know, the senators were extremely critical um, on both sides of the aisle. They were not very forgiving of companies that implement strong encryption. Um, and, and they were pretty, you know, pretty um, strident about it. Um, Senator Graham said to the um, company witnesses, basically, we're giving you a year, and you should either do it or we are going to do it for you. So just, you know, was this a thread of legislation. Um, senator Dianne Feinstein, my senator from California, said she's never been more exercised or, you know, sort of committed to an issue as she is to this one. Um, and Feinstein mentioned that um, she might uh, bring back a bill that she had introduced um, in 2016 with Senator Burr that would basically outlaw unbe unbreakable encryption and mandate that companies that provide encryption have to also be able to disclose plain tax to law enforcement upon receipt of a court order. Um, that bill went nowhere then. But as I said, I think times have really changed in terms of public perception of, uh, of companies and this renewed government interest uh, in um, you know, trying to do something about the, uh, about the problem of law enforcement access to, to plain text. Um, obviously, this is not uh, uniform. Um, some members of the House of Representatives have taken a different tack. Representative Zoe Lofgren, also my representative for my district in California, um, and a bipartisan set of House representatives uh, introduced a bill that also went nowhere that would prohibit intelligence and law enforcement agencies from forcing companies to insert encryption backdoors um, into their products and services. As I said, that bill went nowhere. Congress is pretty dysfunctional. I think I can fairly say that. Um, so to people who find the status quo uh, more satisfying than what a legislated future can be, we have a little window of time here while Congress is just flailing about. Um, but I don't think we can count on that um, to continue to be the, the status quo. Um, because I think some things have changed since two years ago. Um, and in my view, those are um, three pretty important things. One is that in the, um, in the discussion of strong encryption, um, there's been a shifting focus from counterterrorism to interdiction of child sexual abuse materials, um, or CSAM, which is the, um, which is the more inclusive term t today for child pornography. Um, so a shift to the concern with CSAM and with other kinds of online instances of child abuse, such as um, predators grooming children for, for abuse and for attacks. 
Um, I think that the conversation, number two, has evolved into um, a uh, sort of a, into bite-sized pieces that are easier for each one to, to chew. I think that the kind of frontal attack on encryption as a whole and the idea that we need backdoors is something that um, advocates for backdoors um, have realized is not like a persuasive rhetorical strategy and didn't get them anywhere because you could always, you know, basically, the enc encryption is something people began to understand as something we need to protect our privacy, to protect our security, to protect our human rights, and backdoors were sort of uniformly seen as illegitimate or, you know, improper in some way. And so now the move is away from talking about backdoors or talking about encryption as a whole and kind of dividing the world up into different types of products and services, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but for example, dividing the um, considerations about on-device encryption for data that's at rest versus encryption for data that's in motion. And then the third thing I think is different is that um, to some extent, um, there are a number of uh, important government thinkers who are realizing that for the near future and maybe for forever, end-to-end -end encryption is here to stay. And so if that's true, what are we gonna do about it? And there's been a, a more creative conversation going towards the idea of, okay, if we have end-to-end -end encryption and you know, we don't have a reliable, uh, we don't have a reliable promise that we're always going to be able to access plain text, what else can we do to A, interdict abuse or crime online, and B, to investigate it if, after the fact if it happens? And I think this is a good thing. Um, but I also think that we need to be very careful um, because these recommendations about how to manage online abuse, um, how to punish it, um, may include other technologies that undermine communication security in other ways um, outside of, you know, breaking the encryption. And I think, um, you know, a couple of these ways, and I'll, again, I'll talk more about this, are um, law enforcement hacking, client-side scanning for unwanted um, or uh, illegal materials, um, something like defeating passcode rate limitations, and a much heavier, much heavier dependence on metadata. Um, and I think that my, my, one of the things I want for people to take away from this talk is that, um, you know, kind of contemporaneous with the end-to-end -end debate, which is still ongoing, and, you know, explaining why um, encryption is so important to people's lives, I think that security experts need to think more broadly about the risks and rewards of other ways of undermining communication security um, and how these um, kind of alternatives or fail-safes for um, you know the end-to-end -end debate, end up possibly being you know also very bad and very dangerous for for civil liberties and for human rights. Not all of these solutions are actually going to be good for society, and I think we need to um, get involved in that debate and begin to think more um, broadly about communication security as extending beyond um, encryption to other kinds of things such as metadata um, collection and retention and and that sort of thing. Um, Um, I just want to point out that, again, another thing that's different is that the United States is considering these issues across an international backdrop that's changing even more rapidly than the um, policy debate is here. Um, and I think that we are, uh, because a lot of, you know, WhatsApp or, um, or uh, Facebook or any of these companies are global companies, um, we need to... Uh, you know, basically understand that pressures that come from outside are going to impact what we are able to enjoy here in the United States. And that's not just with regards to criminal stuff, but um, other countries have put pressure on these products because of things like disinformation um, or fake news um, or hate speech, all of which are lawful in the United States but not lawful other, other places. So policies or practices that platforms may put into place to address those issues for, um, in response to government regulation or the threat of government regulation in other countries are um, going to have an impact on Americans here despite the fact that our law doesn't um, provide for that. So I want to give a little bit of a background on the current state of United States law, just to give people kind of a sense of, of where we are. And um, 
In short, there is currently no law in the United States that requires design mandates or that requires weak encryption. But nevertheless, the Department of Justice and the FBI have sort of pushed the idea that, I, so okay, let me be a little more specific, that requires weak encryption for um, software or internet platforms. It's a different story on the phone network. Um, but technical assistance is nevertheless an issue that the DOJ and the FBI litigate um, under particular statutory provisions of US law, and usually in secret. The FBI brings cases, uh, the Department of Justice brings cases that try, in which it tries to force platforms to make changes to products that they have in order to be able to provide plain text. Um, and this is based on statutory provisions in the Wiretap Act and also the All Writs Act, which as you know was an issue in the Apple versus FBI case. Um, we as the American public or any public don't know what these cases are because they're litigated in secret. We only find out when something is leaked um, and right now, the ACLU has a lawsuit um, along with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is in the Ninth Circuit, um, where we are seeking to unseal a court opinion which decided that the FBI could not force Facebook to do something to alter its VoIP implementation over uh, Facebook Messenger. But we don't know what the government was asking for. We don't know why the court ruled against it. We don't know what other cases this is happening in, and we don't know how often. So these things are being battled out. Um, and so it's very hard to make responsible policy when we don't even have a sense of what's going on right now. Um, because forcing technical assistance is not working in every case, um, the Attorney General and law enforcement now have a few options. One is change the law to be more explicit that technical assistance is required, as the UK and Australia have done. The other is to sort of bring public pressure or moral suasion to the companies to try to voluntarily ensure that they can provide plain text uh, upon request. Um, and the third is to just accept, accept the status quo and come up with other ways to meet law enforcement needs. And the answer that the government has found is sort of a all of the above. We're going to try to do all of these. Um, so let's talk specifically about how they're doing this. Okay. So one, I said there's been a change in focus from uh, counterterrorism to uh, CSAM. And I think that uh, we found that that is actually a much more persuasive um, grounds to the public than terrorism was, at least here in the United States. Terrorism is exceedingly rare here in the United States, whereas um, child sexual abuse is, you know, is, a, is a huge problem. Um, and you know, there's been a whole series of New York Times articles about child, different kinds of child abuse online. Um, if you're interested in this field, I really recommend you read those articles. I think it's very important to know where the you know, sort of risks are for, uh, for security. Um, but I think that it, you know, this has been a much more persuasive uh, argument. And I'm not being purely cynical about this. I was a criminal defense attorney for many years. I've seen um, a lot of child pornography cases, and I believe that the internet has exacerbated the problem. But I also think some cynicism is warranted because um, we are not doing uh, everything that we could do or as much as we could do to try to deal with the problem of, um, of uh, sexual abuse for children. For example, um, the the money that has been spent, to, or the money that's been allocated in order to try to address the problem hasn't been fully spent. The Department of Justice is not doing things that it's obligated to do under the law in terms of tracking and reporting. Um, so it's, you know, we have other tools at stake, but this is the one that's being brought up as requiring something in this particular area. Okay, the second thing I mentioned was sort of breaking things up into bite-sized pieces. Um, and so the first time I really saw this as a concrete policy suggestion to divide um, device encryption and the challenges there from transit encryption is in this very influential Carnegie, um, a Carnegie report, um, which was mentioned in the recent uh, Senate Intelligence Committee encryption hearing last month by uh, New York's District Attorney Cyrus Vance, and um, he pointed out that we can 
you know, do something with these devices. Um, and the authors of the paper are, you know, very brilliant luminary people. Ron Rivest, Professor Susan Landau, former FBI General Counsel Jim Baker. Um, and so the idea here is the right one, which different, um, de different devices have different cybersecurity risk profiles. And, you know, maybe there's a way that you can, you know, deal with the low-hanging fruit of device security while leaving transit security alone because that's a much harder problem and poses different cybersecurity risks. Uh, if, for example, the compromise of device encryption requires you to have the device in hand, that may be a natural physical world friction or limitation that would be, you know, more acceptable as a privacy security uh, trade-off than, you know, some other ones. Um, and, and I think, and, and to some extent, I think we've seen that this has kind of um, interfered with some of the unity that tech companies initially had in the Apple versus FBI fight as you kind of pick people off. Like, let's try to separate the device people from the transit people and, you know, kind of, they, you know, they each want to save themselves, and I think that's a big mistake. Um, in fact, in the hearing and before the Senate Intelligence Committee, um, the Facebook testifier said, well, you know, the device issue is separate from us. You should look at them, Apple, because that's more promising. Um, and I think that's, a, you know, I think that's a real problem. Um, and then, you know, looking to other sources for law enforcement needs in order to find a way forward. And I want to say one thing about finding a way forward, and then I want to talk just a tiny bit about um, other ideas for law enforcement um, satisfaction. Um, but I'm coming, I think I have like 10 minutes left, so if people um, think they're going to have questions, I'm definitely going to leave enough time for questions. I'll stop in order to ensure that. So if you have questions, feel free to, you know, start lining up so that we can, so that we can hear what you guys have to say. Um, the first thing about finding a way forward is, I think, you know, we've seen a number of reports that seek to find a way forward. The Carnegie report I mentioned, there's a National Academy of Science report, there's an East-West Institute report, and all of these um, reports have brilliant, illustrious, thoughtful, well-meaning, just great people on them who are doing some very um, valuable and important intellectual work. But I think that all of these efforts have suffered from the same kind of underlying problem, which is twofold. One, the trust problem, which is that uh, I don't think that we can trust the United States government to have only law as the protector of privacy and security. And they've tended to be very US-centric, so we're not taking into account trust problems that citizens have with other governments. Um, and the second thing is the idea of what is it that we're trying to do? Um, if the goal is to ensure reliable access to plain text, that's an assumption that that's the goal we should be seeking. Um, but what I think is that technology has assured government, governments access to more information about us than has ever been available before. And technology has taken that privacy away from us. I think these reports um, have to hold at least equally or more so the question of what can we do to assure that information about us is not going to be um, used indiscriminately, abused, or um, you know, directed towards uh, human rights abuses or civil liberties deprivation, it's gonna be used properly. If you ask the question a different way, you get totally different answers and you get a whole different sense of what the risks and rewards are. Ultimately, I think these um, reports are difficult because they always come up with these very thoughtful questions, the answers to which nobody knows the answer to and are not forthcoming. There are, you know, yes, if we knew that, that would be great, but we don't know. We don't know these risks. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about um, getting over it and accepting it. Jim Baker, who's the former FBI general counsel, um, who was, you know, basically the FBI, was the FBI's lawyer during the Apple versus FBI fight, wrote a piece um, in October of 2019. I don't want to say he exactly changed his mind, but he changed his mind. He was like, okay, um, encryption's here to stay. Now we have to deal with it. Um, and some of that was based on a political calculus. All these years, Congress hasn't done anything, and they're not likely to do anything right now. Um, and some of it was based on a security calculus. 
Um, I think one thing that was influential for him was the idea that 5G networks are going to be rolled out. Um, there's not a, you know, confidence or assurance that the devices that that network is going to run on are going to be trustable. How do you protect yourself in a network where you have like a zero trust and you can't, you can't rely on anything? And then, so I think he became, you know, sort of understanding more that like current, uh, current technological advances, the current situation is going to require strong encryption and backdoors are just not going to work. Um, I think that the idea then is what are we going to do? So Alex Stamos, um, who's the former Facebook uh, CSO, is now, at the, is now at Stanford and has the Stanford Internet Observatory. And from his experience at Facebook, Alex has been asking the question, okay, let's assume an end-to-end -end world, how do you fight abuse online? Um, both as a preventative question and also as a, um, you know, if he, if, how do you find out that the law is broken afterwards? I mean, I think the goals here are to say, like, okay, the fact that we have end-to-end -end encryption doesn't mean we have to throw up our hands on security and just accept whatever. There are still things we can do. Now, obviously, law enforcement issues are not the only ones. Other, you know, there's hate speech, there's harassment, there's trolls, there's false accounts, there's disinformation and different um, suggested uh, remedies will apply more or less to different ones of them. Um, I think the point I want to make, though, is that I've said this is a step forward. I think saying, like, okay, let's accept that encryption is here and we still want to live in a beautiful world. Um, you know, it's one step towards the beautiful world. Let's keep making it more beautiful. And what are we going to do? Um, and I think that one of the things we have to be very careful about um, particularly given the fervor of the political debate, and I think, as you can tell, I don't think that um, right now we have the upper hand in the end-to-end -end encryption policy debate. One thing I think we need to be careful about is not to trade away things or like accept compromises um, that we're going to be sorry that we have later on. Because these compromises also create privacy and security harms. And if we're thinking about, I mean, I'll put it this way, um, you know, cryptography and um, Cryptography and cryptanalysis is an um, exciting, intellectual, wonderful academic field. But it has this real world political valence. And you guys all know that. That's why you're all here. Um, and the reason why it has that valence is because, uh, at least one of the reasons, is because of communication security. And so I think it um, behooves us all to look at the problem of com communication security more broadly as solutions are offered to um, the policy debate about end-to-end -end encryption interfering with law enforcement needs. So a couple, a couple examples. One, law enforcement hacking. Backdoors are bad, but I think law enforcement hacking is really bad too. Um, to me, the issue is not so much a privacy issue, I think we're all familiar with that, but a cybersecurity issue. If the government's an incentivized attacker on the network, you're going to see um, vulnerability hoarding. You're going to see, um, you know, participation in the market for vulnerabilities um, with money flowing to groups like NSO Group or FinFisher. Um, and, you know, these are businesses that have been uh, associated with human rights attacks on, you know, and human rights, human rights abuses by their clients, by their governments. Um, then I think also, you know, we're, are, is this something that companies that require their users' trust are really going to want to stand up for? Um, I think maybe everybody in the audience is aware of Facebook sued, um, Facebook and WhatsApp sued NSO Group for uh, um, attack that was uh, executed through WhatsApp servers. And they sued NSO Group under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, um, which people who know me know is my least favorite statute, um, in order to uh, you know, basically say, we don't want our platform uh, to, be a, you know, to be a vector for this. Um, dependence on metadata is another, to my mind, unwelcome trend. If you go to Congress and you say, you don't have to regulate us because we're going to use this metadata in all these ways, there's a real disincentive to protecting metadata better or to not collecting metadata because you're basically saying, here's what we're going to do in exchange. Are encryption, encryption backdoors worse than um, over-collection of metadata? I think yes, but is over-collection and over-retention of metadata a real privacy and security problem? I think also yes. So uh, the message I'm hoping to give here is that um, we can't be complacent about this issue. Um, there is a real lack of expertise still on the part of policymakers. Um, it is not, uh, you know, sort of ubiquitous among the government. And I think that the, um, the contribution 
of people who care about communication security and security experts is invaluable in this field. So I hope that gave people a good overview of where we are now. And um, thank you. And can I take one question? Is that right? OK, and we'll do some question now, so thank you. Can you speak to the issue of, uh, of corporate asset use um, and corporate, corporate rights to uh, knowing what's, how the systems are being used? I believe that uh, it's been so long since I've been involved, I had a corporate hat on, uh, and having to deal with the Email Privacy Act, which allowed corporations access, rightful access to all email use with inside the corporations. Can you speak to the issues in, in, in balancing the, the, the corporate uh, right to knowing how their assets are being used versus the end-to-end encryption and the rest? Yeah, uh, the way that's usually been resolved in the law is through notices or terms of service. Um, which for all their, their weaknesses have been the way that you know, we've dealt with who has access to email. So on commercial platforms that are offered to the public, for example, Gmail, there's a, you click yes and it says we can scan your email for our business purposes or spam interdiction or for advertising or whatever. And those are the things that have been really upheld. In, in um, the employment context or even in like a university context, um, that's equally as true, maybe more so. And then the only question is, is there other protection that's, a, that's, that's applied, um, for example, from law enforcement access? And that protection is either in, if there is other protections, it's either in the Electronic Communications Privacy Act um, or ECPA. It may be in the Fourth Amendment, um, depending upon you know, the circumstances. And there are some state laws now, like Cal ECPA in California, that also provide some additional protection. But I think that your, I mean, a, overall, what I would say is that your expectation of privacy vis-a-vis -vis corporations um, is in the United States, you know, not really anything. That may be changing as the GDPR in Europe kicks in and um, those more uh, protective data privacy uh, regulations are applied by uh, company, global companies throughout the, the, all of their users. Um, on, the, um, on the situation where law enforcement uh, does not have enough access to plain taxes, as they phrase it, I am curious, um, in your circle of you know, law professionals, uh, folks who do policy, and you know, uh, involved in creating laws and these kinds of things, has homomorphic encryption ever come up as a possible step forward or a uh, way to alleviate the problem? Um, no, it hasn't. I don't think that people who are in the policy debate in particular have that like level of sophistication. Um, I think that the technological sophist sophistication has sort of been at the level of let's um, incentivize slash force companies to figure out how to do it, and however they do it, that's their problem and haven't really uh, talked about, you know, well, we, we as the policymakers need to figure out the answer to that. Before we go to third and fourth uh, question, can next speaker be prepared for the microphone, please? Very warm and okay. Thank you. Uh, so given that the, the law alone is not sufficient to protect human rights, um, if we lose this policy battle, uh, to what extent do you think we might need to use math and technology uh, to try to subvert the law or to try to engage in civil disobedience and uh, in order to protect a free society? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, in particular, I've been thinking about that in connection with the Hong Kong protesters and um, the ways that they are looking to use communications technologies to organize or to defeat face recognition. Um, and I think that you know, technology has a long history of being you know, used both for oppression and as a technology of resistance and, and empowerment. My colleague, John Callis, who I think many of you in this room may know, he um, works with me at the ACLU as a um, technologist, is currently working on a paper about exactly this issue, which is what are the technologies of resistance that help people protect their own civil liberties in a context where the law isn't, isn't doing that job. So I guess what I would say is check back in with me in you know, a couple of months, and we'll have something great for people to look at then. Thank you. Um, and then I think the... Last question. Oh, no, there is one on the top. Here. Oh, I'm sorry. OK, oh, okay. so I'm sorry. We'll go. Who's, who was first? OK, oh. the person okay. in the top. Sorry, it's hard, a little so hard for me to see. No, yeah, no prejudice no meant for your being um, there. Thanks so much, especially for your kind of longer term view of all, all these issues. Uh, one question that I have is, 
um, how much do you see the current debate around end-to-end -end encryption being symptomatic of the current political climate and the current administration in the United States? And to what extent do maybe we just kind of like have to hold the line for uh, maybe a couple of years, maybe a couple more years, um, and if we can get past that, then we can kind of address all these longer-term issues and we might have kind of survived this recent iteration of this kind of multi-generational kind of war that's happening? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I don't think this is a problem of this administration. I mean, we saw this issue come up in the Obama administration. We saw it come up in the, um, in the Bush administration. We saw it come up in the Clinton administration. I mean, I think that it is um, a battle that will be ongoing. And, you know, un unfortunately, and I think that's one of the reasons why I think we want to be very careful about how we hold the line here. Um, because if you let uh, the policy battle kind of chip away, and little things we're never going to we're never going to win. It's not like well we'll give this away and we'll preserve this because the Department of Justice will still be here caring about this stuff like 35 years later and I'll be retired. So we need to expect that this is a continuous ongoing um, policy battle and be prepared for it personally and also view it as something in the long run. So more than a couple of years, I think you're going to have to hold on. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. And, and brief answer, please. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, so I read the New York Times pieces. Uh, they were extremely difficult. Um, it's something I think a lot about as a technologist who designs uh, cryptography systems. And I guess I sort of have the opposite question, which is uh, in our community, we have a lot of discussions about holding the line and making sure we don't compromise and making sure that we have secure systems. But I guess I also wanted to ask, like, how can we listen to people who have problems, to people who have been trafficked online? And how, like, how can we do things on our end without compromising um, just general privacy? Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, I think, and I think that I may have made a mistake or have been sort of been at fault or committed this, this crime myself in that, you know, we sort of portray there's in strong encryption and then there's like, people who are hurt. And I know you weren't implying this, but I'm sort of correcting myself. And the, the, the issue that we all know is really there are people who are hurt without strong encryption, and there are people who um, are hurt and uh, the perpetrators are more likely to be able to get away with it, or we don't know that it's happening also because of, um, because of encryption, it's just not seen, right? And so the question is, how do we manage to you know, deal with both of these? And this is one of the things I think that Alex Stamos is trying to do, which is to basically say, can we learn from things like social graph analysis or metadata that these are people who are um, likely victims. Can we take um, you know, the information we already have and use it to identify perpetrators? And you know, how are we going to go about doing that in a way that is um, you know, civil liberties friendly and also adequate? And I think you know, these are easier questions to answer when it comes to things like disinformation or fake news or trolls or that sort of thing. Um, but I think that you know, there's a sort of active conversation going on now about ways to do that in an end end world. And I think that, you know, in a lot of fronts, this is something that's becoming, like, accepted by some people, including the former FBI general counsel, that that's the world we're going to live in, and so we need to take that responsibility seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Let's give her a great hand. Thank you. That was a great discussion. So uh, we'll move on to the next session on voting. Uh, we are happy to have another invited talk on um, weaknesses in the Moscow internet voting system by uh, Pierrick. The floor is yours. Thanks. Is it working? Yes. Well, thanks for the introduction, and uh, thank you so much for the, to the organizers for inviting me and for uh, giving me this opportunity to, to talk about this work. So this is joint work with uh, Alexander Golovnev uh, from Harvard. Uh, actually, I started with one attack on uh, the Moscow system, and uh, he came with another one, and then uh, we discussed together, trying to understand what was going on. And uh, I should also mention uh, Julia Kivonozova from Estonia, so she's Russian, and everything sh started thanks to her, because she actually advertised all this stuff about the Moscow internet voting system with a blog post written in English and everything else written in Russian. So, I mean, I would have no clue about what was going on without her. Um, I should take this. 
So the, the, the plan for today is first I will give a bit of context about this uh, Moscow in internet voting system. And uh, then I will describe uh, the encryption schemes and the vulnerabilities that were in there. And then I will try to give a hint about the more general picture about this voting system, because actually the encryption scheme is part of the, the system, but uh, the, everything was uh, complicated, say. OK, so uh, what was the context? So the, the, the elections uh, in Russia in September, there, there were some global things for, for local uh, elections in Russia. And specific, specifically in Moscow, the goal was to um, decide to elect the, the city parliament, the Moscow Duma. And uh, so this is the legislative part of the of the power in Moscow. There is also a city government with a mayor uh, for the executive part. So this city parliament, uh, this Duma, uh, has 45 members, and uh, each one is elected by one district. So the, the general uh, area of Moscow is uh, split into 45 districts with a bit of uh, things like tack and gerrymandering just to uh, adapt uh, to what you want for the result. And uh, each district um, elects one representative, one member, and uh, all the districts have more or less the same number of voters. In total, that's, this is uh, more, a bit more than 7 million voters. And uh, the rules are pretty simple. Uh, you have candidates for each district, district and uh, the, the candidate who gets the more votes, the largest number of votes, gets the seat. So you have, as you can guess, uh, this kind of threshold effect uh, even if there are 7 million uh, voters, maybe a change by 100 or maybe uh, 1,000 votes can really uh, change the, the, uh, whether or not one guy gets a seat uh, rather easily, especially because the, the turnout, turnout was not so high. Anyway, uh, in September in this year, they decided for the first time uh, for this kind of election to have some kind of internet voting experiment, and uh, it was restricted to three districts three among 45, and uh, any voter could register in advance to uh, use this internet voting system. No need to be abroad or to justify in a way or another that you wanted to use it. So it was, uh, it was the rules, and um, they expected something like 10,000 uh, internet voters, and that's what they got in the end. Uh, maybe you don't remember exactly the context of this summer, but this was not exactly a peaceful context. There were several protests in uh, July and August due to the re rejection of opposition candidacies, and uh, there were up to 20,000 participants in one of the rallies. And uh, okay, maybe with my French point of view, this is a tiny number, 20,000 participants. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, it was... It, it was really not good conditions to do experiments, but in a sense, uh, I mean, if things are bad, maybe you want to change the system, so, well, I don't know. Um, enough with politics, and uh, going back to the technicalities, so there were some public testing that was organized with a bounty program of up to 2 million rubles, so this is about $30,000. And the source code was made public. I mean, part of the source code. Only uh, some of the source code that was run uh, here and there, you, we didn't have anything about the infrastructures. And uh, various scenarios of attack were uh, proposed with uh, some, some document uh, called formal offer, the PDF. But uh, actually, don't trust th this name. Everything was written in Russian, so it was actually not so easy to really understand what was going on. And also, uh, the, in this uh, GitHub uh, repository, you had the source code, which is, of course, in different languages, independent uh, of the, the, the human language. But all the comments, I mean, a lot of the comments, and there are not so many, and uh, no documentation was written except a few words in Russia. So, yeah, I think this is the main difficulty. It was the main difficulty. There was no specification, no documentation, just part of the source code. And uh, this uh, contest, I mean, this um, testing was not really part of a formal certification process. It was not says, like, if there is this kind of attack, and blah, 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 maybe we stop, or, I mean, it was, 
kind of, oh, let's organize this and we'll see what comes out. And in the end, they decided anyway that, I think from the beginning, they had decided that they would run the election on the experiment, uh, whatever the, the output was. Okay, so the timeline for uh, this summer. So as you can see, the code publication was done 17th of July for an election which was less than two months uh, later. This is incredibly short. And uh, furthermore, it was, uh, so it was announced in Russian. And uh, so Julia Krivonosova wrote a, a blog post uh, pretty shortly thereafter, and it was advertised to the um, academic uh, e-voting community. And, uh, but well, somehow it took some time uh, for me or for others to, to really uh, realize that there was something there. And furthermore, I was on vacation. So uh, it took me some time, but when I came back, uh, I had to look at the code and then, oh, there was some attack. So I published them, I mean, I, of course, I, uh, I told the, the Moscow people, but also I wanted uh, really to be sure that they would do something. So uh, uh, a few days after, I released the thing on archive so that they could really, uh, they, they had to uh, change something. And uh, they did, they did the first update uh, a few weeks later, uh, two weeks later, I'd say, a bit in a rush. And then uh, a few days thereafter, Alexander Golovnev found another attack on this uh, new version. And then uh, it was getting pretty, pretty close to the D-Day. Uh, they did some last tests, uh, last minute, last public test. And uh, they finally updated the public code two days before. Okay. So what were the, these attacks? Uh, the encryption scheme uh, in this uh, system is, build, is based on uh, El Gamal. Uh, so that's a uh, very classical encryption scheme. I recall it more or less for the, the notations and the, because they, they implemented a variant of it, so I need some notation to explain the variant. So they use Z, Z over PZ with safe primes, and uh, I use G for the notation of the generator, SK, PK for the public key, secret key, and then the El Gamal encryption is just uh, you consider this public key as some kind of first half of a DFL man, you do the second half uh, yourself, and then you use this shared key to one time pad your message which is supposed to be in the group. And uh, of course, in your, in your part, you need to, to do it properly with a proper random to be used only once, blah, blah, blah. Decryption, the decryption is then I mean, undoing all, all these things. Rather, rather easy. Uh, if done correctly, and if there, is many, there are many ways to do it badly, uh, this gives you uh, in CPA security, which is of course not enough. But in many, I mean, in, in many e-voting systems, we actually use El Gamal still with some extra stuff to, uh, to get uh, more than in CPA, like in CCA. Here they, they didn't. But this is, oops, this is not, <laughs> this is not the, the, the main problem. Um, wait, 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 why, why is it, did it go so fast? So what they used inside uh, was not a plain El Gamal. They used a triple El Gamal uh, that I, I had never heard before, and for a good reason, uh, because. <laughs> 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 so here is how it goes. You have three primes. P1, P2, P3, all of them being safe primes, and uh, you use three independent uh, El Gamal setting with uh, uh, G1, G2, G3, three generators, and then you, the secret key is the triple of uh, three secret keys, one for each group, and public keys are the corresponding keys. And uh, when you want to encrypt a message, so the message is supposed to be in the first group, Z over P1Z, then you do first El Gamal encryption, of this message aim, you get A1, B1, a pair of, uh, um, a classical uh, pair of encrypted message in the Elgamal setting. You map the first element A1 to the second group so, so that you can re en encrypt this first element with the second group parameters. Then you do it again uh, to, with the third group. So this is kind of chaining 
you have your message, encrypt once, encrypt twice, encrypt uh, a third time. And then, uh, of course, since this uh, LGML encrypted message are pairs of elements, you need to actually uh, send also the BI part. So what you get as the encryption of the message is B1, B2, B3, and the A3. Uh, here, um, I didn't say how to map an element of Z over P1Z into Z over P2Z, because actually there is no natural map. What they do is that they, they lift to Z, to the integer, and then they uh, reduce mod P2 back. Uh, this is all implicit in the source code. Of course, there is no proper description of that. Uh, all the maps are implicit because they didn't use any um, abstract proper group setting uh, with, uh, in their implementation. This is all big integers, so you don't really see these maps. And uh, decryption is just natural. You just do it in the other way around. And uh, of course, you need this inequality P1, P2, P1 less than P2, less than P3, so that uh, during all this mapping, you don't lose information. But yes, this works. So this, this uh, condition, P1 less than P2, less than P3, is indeed enforced in the source code, but without explanation. As for security, that's interesting. Uh, well, contrary to triple less, where the number of operations to break the system is kind of squared, here this is not raised to the cube or raised to the power two, it's just multiplied by three. So breaking, breaking this system is not harder than just breaking the free underlying El Gamal completely independently. So in terms of security, well, there is no point in doing that. That's fine. <laughs> so why? So we didn't get the final answer. Of course, I, I asked and uh, asked many questions to the, the region, but I speculated. And um, all the PIs are chosen to be less than 256 bits. And this is enforced in the source code with this kind of uh, comparison, like P should be less than the solidity max int uh, value, which is 256, maybe five, I mean, maybe this is signed integer, I don't remember. But solidity, as you probably know, is the smart contract language of, of Ethereum. And uh, in the code, there is indeed a decryption function written in this uh, language. So there is some kind of smart contract doing the decryption. And uh, the max size so is, is indeed that one. And it looks like the author didn't have time or the competence to write a multi-precision library in Solidity, and they decided to increase the security in another way. That's my guess. I have no, I, I mean, I didn't get the, the answer to my uh, question, but uh, you'll see later that I have good reason for offering that. <laughs> so basically, why blockchain is bad? Okay, so we are left to, uh, with, with the problem of solving a DLP uh, module prime of 256 bits. And the challenge in Russian says that it must be done in less than 12 hours, so that uh, you, are, you, are, you have really broken the system. Uh, so historically, breaking such a discrete log was done maybe 10 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, maybe. Well, there is a database that we host in, in, in my group uh, where we have all the public computation, and uh, it was done first in, two, uh, in um, 95, 96 by Weber, Denny, and Zayer. Uh, it took some time, uh, uh, that date, of course. And just to remind you, the, the current record is a bit less than 800 bits. We, did, we, we announced that uh, two months ago with my, my colleague. So, but this uh, current record took ages and ages. Uh, it didn't take less than 12 hours. How much time does it take today to solve this 256-bit uh, discrete log? Is it less than 12 hours? And uh, what we can do is just check with available, uh, publicly available software. So I check with uh, three things. SageMath, which uses GP Perry internally for DLP, so this is free software, and this is actually not bad for small sizes. But for 256, it did not finish after four days, and I stopped the job there. Uh, I tried with Magma, which is not free software, it's proprietary software from uh, University of Sydney, and uh, this is faster than SageMath, but this uses a lot of memory, and for these sizes, it took 24 hours with 130 gigabytes of memory. That's a, a bit too much. 
And uh, then, of course, I've tried KDOFS. Well, actually, I tried KDOFS first because I am one of the developers. Uh, <laughs> 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 and uh, so this is free software developed mostly in, uh, in our group in Nancy. And uh, this is based on the number field sieve. The two first things use uh, the variants of the quadratic sieve. Uh, but I guess for this kind of size, this is not clear that the number field sieve is faster. But, well, actually, uh, our implementation in Cado NFS is much faster. And uh, this is the same, actually, code that was used for the, the latest record I mentioned uh, one slide ago. So for 256 bits, it takes less than 10 minutes in less than one gigabyte. So this is far less than what was expected. And more precisely, I used my just uh, nothing special desk. PC uh, for this, and uh, you see that this is just uh, hundreds of seconds to, to compute this secret keys. So uh, we did it, uh, I did it completely independently for the three keys, and didn't care about the multi thing, just multiply the rain time by three. Um, nothing, well, maybe I can skip this, but. Uh, just I uh, wanted to mention that for this kind of small sizes, actually our software was not so so much uh, fully tested. We, we usually use it for uh, uh, record computation, and uh, here actually it was failing from time to time due to bad parameters in the descent phase. But uh, this was quickly fixed for the occasion, and then it was pretty stable and uh, could really solve uh, this kind of sizes uh, quite easily. So they fix it. And uh, so the first fix, first of all, they removed the triple Elgamal encryption. They increased the key size to 1024 bits. And they changed the protocol so that decryption was no longer part of the smart contract. So they didn't have to implement this uh, multi-precision in the Solidity language. That's why I really think that uh, this was the reason. Because they, there were no other reason at that, I mean, so close to the real uh, election to change the protocol. Uh, I mean, it's dangerous to change the protocol, uh, even if it's done months before, but here it was only days before the D-Day. So uh, really, uh, for me, this is the kind of confirmation that the, this uh, limit in solidity was the reason why they have uh, this triple Elgamal and these short keys. And the uh, last thing they did is that they took generators in the prime order subgroup, subgroup because actually, that was also one thing they did bad in the, the first version. They, they took generators for the full subgroup, for, for the full Z over PZ star group, and so they were potentially leaking one bit uh, due to subgroup attacks. And um, so they fixed that. Uh, so I, I mentioned that in my, in my first note, and they fixed that. But they fixed that badly, actually. They failed again. So uh, Golovnev noticed that actually, okay, the generator is in the prime order subgroup, but the message stayed out, I mean, in, in general, uh, in the general group. So one bit, one bit is actually leaked from the ciphertext. You know for sure if the message is a quadratic residue or not. And, uh, well, this is one bit. And one bit is, uh, could be actually very important in e-voting. E Quite often, there are actually only two main candidates, one pro-Putin and one opponent. opponent. So if one has an ID that is a Q or a quadratic residue and not the other, then, well, you have no, no privacy. I mean, OK, this is in the clear. And yes, from the source code, the encrypted message is indeed an, in, an identifier of the candidate with no random nouns, nothing special. So really, this attack was. Uh, realistic. This typical scenario was completely realistic. From here, we, we are getting pretty close to the election, and the situation got completely chaotic. I mean, I did not understand what was going on. Uh, many things were happening via the press, via interviews, everything in Russian, and I did not really follow everything. So uh, um, my co-author was understand, understanding at that point much better than me what was going on. And uh, the developers seemed, seemed actually to deny that this, this second attack was a real one. Uh, still, they silently changed the code without updating the GitHub so that they could run a final public test with this modified code and say, oh, you see, there is no problem. And uh, well, it's still, I mean, and only two days before the election, they changed the, uh, the GitHub. So why do, do we know that they silently changed? It's because during the, the, the public test, 
Of course, they have to send the JavaScript to the voters so that they can encrypt. And from this, I mean, reading this JavaScript, uh, we could really see the, uh, the patch that they did. And um, well, this was minified, but this was not uh, obfuscated, so it was not too hard to really uh, understand what was going on. Okay, so this was the story with the encryption scheme. In the end, I guess they had something that was reasonable in terms of encryption, still only in CPA, but well, depends on how it's put uh, in the general protocol. And actually talking about the protocol, uh, it's actually, it was pretty difficult to, to get, uh, to understand how this uh, protocol was going on because the, the source code was not about the protocol. It was pieces here and there. We didn't have the whole picture. And so everything is done based, uh, I mean, everything that follows is based on speculations, discussions, press articles, the source code, everything, and, uh, something like that. And my general impression is that the whole protocol is really, really bad. As far as I understand, there is no privacy. Verifiability, a bit. With, uh, I mean, they use blockchain and uh, for that purpose, so that actually you put your vote uh, in some public ledger and then you can check that it is really there during the, 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 the tally. In terms of coercion resistance or vote buying, uh, there was nothing. And uh, it's a big issue in uh, such a contest with, where there is a uh, tension. Uh, so my conclusion is that actually this encryption being fixed is just like having a, a very strong door, but the house is really, really open. So what did we get about the, the, the protocol? Uh, the registra registration authentication part of this protocol was based on existing infrastructure for, for the uh, administration in Russia, and uh, nothing specific to this election, and uh, I couldn't really get any hint about that for how it was going, but this is not specific to the election, so let's assume it's okay. Uh, the voting part. So the voter connects to the server, gets the JavaScript, JavaScript from it. Then the choice is encrypted locally in the browser uh, or the smartphone with the key of the election and sent back. So this is where this encryption that was completely flawed at the beginning uh, got involved. Then you have the ballot box, and the server uh, received the encrypted ballot, and, uh, and it puts it in the ballot box, which is basically uh, some kind of Ethereum blockchain. And uh, with no reference to the voter, and to try to make this no reference to the voter uh, more uh, a reality, this is a bit uh, randomized in terms of uh, time. I mean, the server will, would wait to have mm, dozens of ballots and then uh, randomize a bit and then uh, send them to the, the blockchain a bit later in a different order. And at the end of the election, the trustees who own the decryption key, and they use uh, secret Shamir for the, uh, Shamir secret sharing for that, and they, they decrypt the ballots and put them in the blockchain as well. But somehow they also publish the decryption key. So, 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 so. So this is for ver verifiability, actually. This is for proving, this is their proof of correct decryption. I, I discussed about them and they, they say, oh yeah, zero knowledge would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, but actually, I mean, uh, in fact, for the designers, uh, this encryption is here only to protect against uh, revealing the partial tally during the election day. Yeah, it's not there for the privacy. I mean, I realized that only late because without the specification, it's not so easy to, to realize that uh, encryption is just for almost nothing. So the privacy is guaranteed by the server. Uh, the server is honest and will cut any link between the ballot and the voters. It, so the voters connect, authenticate, and the, the, the server checks that he is allowed to vote, blah, 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 then you receive the ballot. And then the server should forget everything and put, the, put the, the ballot in the ballot box. So if you want a bit of redundancy, if you want a bit of, uh, I mean, if you have databases everywhere and uh, 
backups. I mean, it's almost impossible to have this kind of uh, cutting the link. But well, that's what they that's what they have they have in mind, and that's why also this limit of 12 hours well, uh, for for breaking the system was there. It was because actually 12 hours was the the time before. Okay, we are going to decrypt and reveal the private key anyway. So this was the reason. And, uh, Took some time to understand that. Okay, further remarks uh, about the, the general system, the blockchain. So first of all, I have no idea why they wanted to have the decryption made in the smart contract in the beginning. I mean, it was probably, oh, okay, because we can. Well, uh, but in the end, uh, it had bad consequences. Uh, more uh, of a problem, the blockchain was a private one. So just run by several nodes, that we are not publicly known, and uh, no guarantee that they are really independent. So actually, from my point of view, that it provides no guarantee whatsoever. And during the election, the voters could query the, the blockchain, but via a web server. So I don't know. I mean, my, my impression is that it was just for the general uh, theater that they had this blockchain. And the uh, second remark is that the, the interaction with the Moscow Department of Information Technology, the, the people who designed, developed, and deployed this uh, system, it was very frustrating. They, 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 answered, they were very nice and polite and everything, but they answered only to some of my technical questions, on only those that we are not embarrassing. So I asked several times, can I get some documentation, specification? Uh, what do you assume in terms of uh, security? What are your, your trust assumption? Do you trust the server? Do you care about coercion resistance? For these kind of questions, uh, no answer. I mean, they just ignore this part of my email. So this, it was really very frustrating to, to interact with them. Uh, what occurred on the D-Day? So they did not consult the, the use of internet voting. They got, as I said, 10,000 votes, about 10,000 votes by internet. And in one of the three districts, the difference between the, the first and the second candidate was less than 100 votes. So actually, these 10,000 votes uh, could have made, make a difference. I mean, we don't know. But, uh, so this is really, uh, it proves somehow that uh, this system was used for something uh, very important. I mean, it could really change the, the, the color, maybe not the color, but at least one of the uh, elected members of the parliament. And um, a few hours after the election, the access to blockchain was cut. Okay. So this is, I mean, public ledger, I mean, blockchain, usually you, you, you think, okay, it's going to be there forever, everybody, everybody is going to be able to check uh, that uh, what was there has not been erased, but if you have private nodes and that at some point they disappear, you get nothing. But fortunately, journalists of the Medusa online newspaper, so this is a, a newspaper that is exiled in Riga, and they made a copy of the blockchain before the shutdown, and they got all the ballots and all and the decryption key, and they made that public. So, and one of the journalists, who was also a voter, managed to keep track of his network communication during the voting, and could indeed check that his ballot was really in the blockchain and was taken into account. So there is some kind of verifiability. One people uh, with a lot of skills could really follow his vote which is not so bad. I mean, I mean I'm joking, but in France, we don't have that, so. <laughs> so, as a conclusion, um, what was the impact? I guess our uh, impact was not really fixing the encryption. I mean, the, the whole system was a big mess, and in the end, the encryption was not really for privacy. But what we showed was that it was not the perfect skin that, is, that was adver advertised at the time. I mean, oh, yeah, with the blockchain, this is wonderful. Uh, E-voting is going to be perfect. It will solve our problem. No, it's not like that. And we got, we got uh, large press coverage, especially in Russian. I didn't understand everything. But well, what I got is that Medusa people, these are really, really good. These are good journalists, and they are know about what they are talking about in terms of techniques. Yeah, really, really good. And uh, Moscow had to acknowledge the problems. And uh, my hope is that some of the voters decided based on that not to go, not to use the internet voting system, but use traditional voting. 
And um, on the longer term, I'm pretty sure that uh, this, I mean, pretty sure, I hope that this story will help putting some pressure that, that they get a better system in the future and uh, because they plan to do other experiments in the future. And I uh, would like to conclude with a positive note. I mean, really, it's, it's amazing that they organized some public testing on the open uh, part of the source code. Not so many uh, countries do that. And uh, I mean, Switzerland is a big uh, exception, but over, uh, apart from them, there are not so many uh, countries that do that. So this should be commended. And uh, maybe you could take that as an example uh, with your own government. Even Russia opened their source code when they are doing <laughs> uh, e-voting. So I guess this concludes my talk. Thank you. Question? Uh, yes. Thank you for a great talk. Thanks. Um, there are opinions I heard even here in the US that uh, for a bit better security of uh, voting, uh, if you do it on a large scale, some parts, not everything, but some parts maybe should be still done using some physical things like cards, like bulletins, well, not everything, but just a bit to prevent certain sort of manipulation. Do you kind of support this approach? And if yes, which part would you make a bit less digital? Yeah, uh, okay, uh, this, uh, I've heard about this position, especially in the US, but in the US they use voting machine, and then this is uh, really, uh, I mean, I think it really makes sense to have also uh, the voting machine giving you some kind of paper receipt that you can have uh, list, risk limiting audits and this kind of stuff. So this is uh, really good. I, I really support this opinion in the case of voting machine. For internet voting, uh, how do you get pieces of paper? Uh, so for instance, in Switzerland, uh, they receive some uh, piece of paper, for some voting materials by the, uh, by the post. So then you have some trust assumption of the postal, uh, on the postal system, but uh, yes, why not? <laughs> and uh, a more general uh, answer is that I don't think uh, internet voting is ready for deployment uh, for a very high stake election, especially if you want to combine coercion resistance, uh, verifiability, and uh, all the properties that you would like to have, uh, we are not yet fully ready. So yeah, this is some kind of answer. How did they determine that the votes that were cast were cast by people who were allowed to vote? Um, so this is the... I don't, I don't know exactly the details. Because this is the, what I call registration authentication. This is based on some kind of, uh, of uh, infrastructure already existing for e-administration in Russia. So uh, I don't know the details. But uh, this is nothing like a physical device, like an electronic ID or something like that. This is just, I guess, based on passwords and things like that that you own as a citizen. But uh, I don't know the details for that. Use the yeah. uh, to be registered as in point one, you still have to present some physical things. So you cannot do it fully online. For, for the first time, I guess. For the first time. For the first time, but then the after you... Uh... After you can proceed as you Yeah. Um, I've got two questions, but feel free to only take one of them. The first one is, is there a good open source e-voting system anywhere? That was interesting. And then the second point was just to pick up on your comment just now, which was to say that you don't think internet voting is ready. I'd be interested in to, to hear why you think that. Okay. Uh, for the first question, I guess it depends on uh, your scenario. It depends on your context. If you want to have, if you don't care about uh, coercion resistance, for instance, then there are, there are systems. And uh, my favorite one is one uh, that was de de developed for uh, the um, Geneva uh, uh, canton in, uh, in Switzerland. It's, it has never been deployed, but the source code is, is there, it's available. You have plenty of documentation, a huge uh, security analysis, and this is a very good one. But in Switzerland, they don't care about uh, coercion resistance. So. And uh, I guess the reason why uh, this answers the, the second 
question, part of your question, uh, in many cases, you also want coercion resistance. And if you want to combine a coercion resistance with all the other properties, then this is really, really hard and usually not practical. You, for the layman, it will be completely impossible to understand what's going on. That's my, my current understanding of the, the state of the art. Let's thank the speaker. Okay. Thank you very much. So we will continue on on how weak that is, the internet, um, internet voting today. And then the speaker is Olivier. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I will keep talking about e-voting. The main topic of the previous talk was mostly about privacy. This one will be mostly about um, verifiability. And I will focus mostly on the Swiss case with implications to Australia and other countries. So um, Switzerland is an interesting country for voting and for internet voting in particular. Internet voting has been used for government elections, at least trial for government elections since 2003, so there is a long history there. Many systems have been trialed, and if you go to roughly the fall of 2018, only one of those systems was left, partially for financial reasons. It's expensive to keep funding the development of several systems. And that system was S-Vote, which was commercialized by Swiss Post and developed by Cytel. During the fall of 2018, Swiss Post decided to enter a new certification process that would authorize using a new version of S-Vote, S-Vote version 2, by up to 100% of the voters in Switzerland. There were several conditions as part of this certification process, and one of them was that the election should become completely verifiable, meaning that voters should have a way to verify that their vote intent has been properly captured by the system, and that the tally should be verifiable by any auditor willing to do so. The second condition is that the voting system should pass a public review. So um, the public review phase started in February 2019, and at the end of March, the Swiss Federal Chancellery and Swiss Post announced that internet voting would not be available for the upcoming May elections. It was not available for the federal elections in October, and it's not known when it will be available again in Switzerland. So this is essentially the story I would like to tell you about now. So, um, like I said, the certification process included a public review phase, and it was regulated, and one important part of this regulation was saying that anyone should be entitled to examine, modify, compile, and execute the source code of the voting system, and to write and publish to these DRAM. So that's really a very good and interesting thing. Um, what it became in reality when Swiss Post decided to publish the code is that if you wanted to access the code, you needed to register and accept some conditions of use that included a responsible disclosure condition. And that included in red that no vulnerability should be published within a period of 45 days since the last communication exchange with the owners. So that essentially means that you have to report vulnerabilities to the owner, which is quite natural, but then if the owner decides to send you an email every 44 days, they can basically silence you forever. So we were not very happy to sign such responsible disclosure conditions, and apparently others felt the same way, and then a few days after publication of the, the code, there was a new uh, Git repo that was published with a gracious name that was containing all the source code. Uh, that repository was taken down a few days later. If you are curious, Sarah, my co-author, um, is hosting a copy of all the code and also of the attacks that we found, uh, if you want to take a look. So um, we accessed the code thanks to that repo, and we started looking at how the system was working. It was a remarkably sophisticated and complex system. One of the core components of the system was a trusted printing service. So that trusted printing service was doing actually two things. The first is essentially what the name is saying. It prints paper ballots. So those paper ballots contained really a lot of things. 
And in particular for this talk, each paper ballot contains one unique key, K, that is printed there, just an AES key. And then it also contains for every possible choice that you can make on the ballot, one return code. So the return code is just a random number, three, four digits. And again, it's picked just as random for each ballot on, um, and for each possible choice that you can make on the ballot. So the voter receives this paper ballot, and then on election day, they can vote um, just using the internet. They would just connect to a web service hosted by Swiss Post. They would make their choice just by clicking on the candidates they would like to support, so just completely natural interface which means that um, the voting client needs to be completely trusted for privacy. If the voting client is compromised, well, the computer sees exactly where the voter is clicking. The voting client knows, where, um, knows the vote. So the voting client is trusted for privacy. The goal of the system is to make sure that the voting client doesn't need to be trusted for correctness. So we want to make sure that if the voting client is corrupted and when I click for A, it actually encrypts a vote for B, I have a way of seeing that. So this is the second job of the trusted printing service to make sure that this will not happen. And the trusted printing service produce a big pile of ciphertext here on the right. So those ciphertexts are computed as follows. For each individual paper ballot, the trusted printing service will take the key that is printed there, derive a new sim um, well, symmetric key from each of the possible answers, so fk of no, fk of yes, and use that key to encrypt the return code that is associated to the choice on the ballot. And then the last thing that the printing service will do is shuffle of those ciphertexts. So at some point in the redaction, the server will decrypt some of those ciphertexts, and the goal is to make sure that when you decrypt one of the ciphertexts, you do not know to which choice the ciphertext corresponds because, well, the ordering is broken. So uh, what the voting client does is when the voter votes, let's say, for a yes, it encrypts a yes, and it also encrypts fk of yes. So the voter will also enter the key, but not the return code, into the voting client so that the voting client can compute fk of yes. And those two ciphertexts are sent to the server. So now there is a distributed description process that will happen on the second ciphertext only. So the server will learn FK of yes, that's a key, doesn't know which ciphertext can be decrypted from that, so it will just try to decrypt all the ciphertexts here until one, succeed, one decryption succeeds. So it will obtain 472, send 472 back to the voter, and the voter will check on the paper ballot that this is the right number. And this is expected to guarantee that the voting client did not cheat. So the voting server will do other things. So when the election is done, it will run a verifiable mixnet with all the encrypted votes, so those first component of the ciphertext. And it will perform also this, in a distributed way um, decryption of the mixed ballots to obtain the election tally. So of course, if you want this to work and have the verifiability properties, you will need to add to this a lot of zero-knowledge proofs. So uh, there were actually three main types of zero-knowledge proofs used in the system. One was to make sure that the ballots were properly built in the sense that when you have those two ciphertexts, it is needed to make sure that it's the same yes or the same no that is encrypted on both sides and not something different. So that when I decrypt this with the yes, I'm sure that there is a yes there too. So this is proven in zero-knowledge. Another place where we need to have zero knowledge proofs is to make sure that the mixing, mixing is correct, so we have proof of shuffle. And then we have proofs of correct decryption of the mixed ballots. So we took a look at those zero knowledge proofs, and what we found is that not a single one of them was actually sound. So there were actually three independent types of mistakes with those zero knowledge proofs, and I just would like to give you a quick look at the kind of difficulties that we found. So the first is with the fiat Chamier transformation. So all those knowledge proofs, they are basically sigma protocols. And in the interactive version of the sigma protocols, you have a prover and a verifier. They all receive the statement about which we want to make a proof. The first step of the protocol, whoops, is a commitment A. 
then there is a random challenge E and a response F. So that's not convenient in a voting system where you want to have verifiability at any time. So we want to make those proofs non-interactive and the traditional solution is to use the fiat Chamier transform. So the idea is to remove the interaction where you send the commitment and receive the challenge and instead send a query to a random oracle with this commitment, get the challenge, and then you can send to the verifier the proof in just one single pass. So that's all good, except that in this voting system you have a slightly different setting. The prover and the verifier, they do not receive a statement in advance. It's really the prover who builds the ciphertext who can choose the statement about which he wants to make the proof. So there is no S coming to P and V, there is a prover who picks the statements and send the statement together with the proof to the verifier. And that small change is just enough to completely break the security proof and to have zero knowledge proofs that are not sound anymore. So basically it's easy to fix because you just need to send the statements with A to the random oracle and then you have security again. But actually that's exactly what is here, what was done in this S-vote protocol. So that was enough to essentially break all the proofs. It breaks individual uh, verifiability because now we cannot trust anymore the proof that when you send those two ciphertexts that really have a consistent encryption, you have two yeses or two no. It also breaks universal verifiability because now when you decrypt the ciphertext, you can claim that the ciphertext decrypt to anything you like and make a proof that you made a correct decryption even if you did not. So that's really a bad thing. So it's easy to fix. The problem is that it's not the only problem. Second problem, remember that um, in those Sigma protocols, the first step is sending a commitment. And one traditional solution for making those commitments is to use Pedersen commitments. So Pedersen commitments, that's how they look. You have G to the S time H to the M. That's the message to which you want to commit. S is a random number. So this is supposed to be perfectly hiding if you have a random S. It is only binding if the discrete logarithm of H in base G is unknown. So of course you need the commitment to be binding, otherwise the soundness of all your zero knowledge proofs collapses again. So we looked in the documentation in the voting system on how do we pick the G and the S, the H, and we found that in order to select the H, well you basically pick a random exponent R, and then you compute H to be G to the R which is exactly the discrete log that you are not supposed to know. So basically the recommendation of the system is just start by picking the trap door that you need if you want to cheat <laughs> and then run the system and people will have to trust you that you do not use the trap door that you had to use in the first place. So uh, basically that again made it possible to cheat with the zero knowledge proof and in particular in the verifiable mixnet we could just change as many votes as we wanted during the shuffling process and prove that the shuffle was honest even though it wasn't. So these are, were essentially cryptographic issues with the proofs, but there were more. And actually even if you fix all the cryptographic things if you're in your proof, if you're not proving the right statement, you are still in trouble. So remember, I say that we needed to prove when we prepare a vote that we encrypt the vote and then we encrypt the key that is, can be used to decrypt the return code associated to, to this vote. So of course in a ballot typically you will have more than one choice to express, so you will have many pairs of such ballots and you would expect that you would have just one zero knowledge proof for each such pair. The thing is that in the system they do not prove that, they decided to prove that instead the product of the vote matches the product of the keys which is of course much weaker because, well, product is commutative, uh, you can have divisors that float between components. Basically, you don't know what to do with that. So we started looking at how we could use this. Um, basically, it means that we can, again, make proofs for statements that are just completely wrong. It was a bit unclear what would happen with the system in that case because it's just a situation that should not happen in the system, so it must not document what would happen when, when you decrypt something, you see a plain text that should not come at any point. So the effect is a bit unclear, but there were also security proofs given for the system, and basically they assume that you're proving the right thing, so the security proof just collapsed. So these are three basic examples of the three different kind of things that we found. There were several other things. 
But basically, the problem when we found that was, okay, what do we do with this? How do we report about this? So uh, like I said, we did not want to register with the review process because we did not want to sign this unlimited NDA. So what we did is to send an email to the Swiss Federal Chancery saying, we found some code on the internet. We don't know if it's authentic, but that code contains issues, so please have a look and tell us what to do. So we had some discussions, and then two weeks later, um, we made simultaneous public statements, the Swiss Federal Chancery, Swiss Post, and us. And thanks to this public release, in particular by the Swiss Post, we learned that the Peterson commitment issue had been spotted by at least two other teams, Rolf Haney from Bern and Thomas Haynes from um, Norway. The next day, we learned something different that was uh, quite a surprise to us. We saw in the press that the New South Wales in Australia Electoral Commission confirmed that iVote, their internet voting system, contains this critical CITIL crypto defect front in Switzerland. So that voting system was to be used in the next few days after uh, this public uh, press release. The system was not publicly available, so we had no idea of what was inside that system. And what puzzled us was the next sentence. It was declared to be unaffected and safe for the upcoming state elections. So we could not understand how you could be affected by this kind of critical crypto defect and still be completely safe for the upcoming state elections. So as it turns out, despite the fact that they were unaffected, they still patched their system and started running the election. So yeah, that was Australia. So we kept reporting more attacks as we found them. And then at the end of March, the Swiss Federal Chancellery and Swiss Post announced that, well, the system would not be available for the upcoming elections. So they had almost two months before the elections. They decided, well, we don't have enough time to fix, while Australia decided, well, in two days we can fix. Uh, different options were taken. Um, a team at Bern also found more issues by inspecting the codes. So for instance, they spotted that Remember that printing service had to randomize all the, the order of all the ciphertext that are sent to the server to make sure that when you decrypt one of the return code, you do not know for which candidate it is. Actually, the shuffling was overlooked. There was no shuffling at all. Meaning that, well, when the server was decrypting one return code, they would basically know to which candidate it was corresponding. So, um, yeah, the conclusion was that there was this election in Australia that was completed, and the Swiss Federal Chancellery decided to just stop everything and start to completely review the trial and auditing process for the system. So two very different directions. To conclude, um, I think that this Swiss Federal Chancellery ordinance that regulated the review of the internet voting, that internet voting process did a lot of good. It gave a view to the public and to the researchers on a very complex and sophisticated voting protocol implemented for real world government elections, which is always interesting to have. It made it possible to spot many critical issues before any actual use in Switzerland, which is good to have. It also benefited to other countries, at least it made it possible for them to know that there had some issues with a voting system, even if those countries decided to not publish anything. Um, basically, the conclusion is that we need more of ordinances like this to have better voting systems and better elections. Thank you. I was curious when the voter sends the encryption of say yes and um, the second component, is it required that the input, yes, is it required that the inputs match? Like suppose the voter wanted to. So the voter is supposed to provide the zero knowledge proof that the yes here okay. is a yes there, okay. or that there is a no on both sides. Okay. So the voting client is supposed to prove that this is the case. Okay. So it's still possible for the voter in the end to prove to someone that they voted a certain way. Yes. Okay. Any other? 
Any other question? If not, we'll thank the speaker and break for coffee.